You probably learned about red blood cells in a high school science class, but most of us don't really know the impact they can have on our bodies when we don't have enough healthy ones. Welcome to Healthy Living, wellness and prevention, medical innovation, the informed side of care. Welcome to Baptist Health Talk. Hi everyone, I'm Willard Shepard, your host for today. And when faced with a shortage of healthy red blood cells, our blood flow can be blocked, causing pain, infection, and fatigue. This is known as sickle cell disease. And here to talk about the impact of this disease, we have our expert today with us, Dr. Neil Moransky, who leads the sickle cell care here at Baptist Health South Miami Hospital, and Josiah Frierson a sickle cell patient who was diagnosed when he was just a baby. Now, thanks to both of you for being here today. Thanks for having us. So before we uh, delve into uh, to this subject today, we want to remind our viewers to send in your questions, your comments below throughout the discussion. And we are here for you and happy to answer any of these questions you may have. Well, first, Dr. Marinsky, tell me a little bit about uh, you've been at this several decades now, how you pick this area of medicine and uh got into this from the very beginning and giving this kind of palliative care to patients who uh, certainly need it. Where are we with this today? So I um, take care of people who have sickle cell disease because it's one of the most complicated symptom management uh, conditions that we have. Um, it's very burdensome on patients. It interferes with, with uh, people trying to achieve their goals, their dreams. And it's a very significant progressive disease that unfortunately has a higher mortality than most. Um, so sickle cell, is a, a, a sickle cell disease is a genetic disorder that one receives from their parents. Um, it happens uh, when both parents have either trait or if one parent has sickle cell disease and one parent has trait. And it is passed on to the unborn child. So when the baby's born, the baby has fetal hemoglobin, which babies have for the first six months of life they're about. And then their own marrow starts to turn on their, their red blood cell manufacturing plants. And you start to express what is happening with the disease. And so what happens is in people with sickle cell disease, they don't make normal red blood cells. They make some normal red blood cells and they make some red blood cells that are very fragile. And so if they become stressed or the body becomes stressed by infection or overexerting, then what happens is they pop from being nice round cells to ones that actually get caught on the blood vessels. And when that happens, you can have a sickle cell crisis. We've come a long way in over the last uh, few decades in how we treat sickle cell disease. So previously with sickle cell disease, we, it was primarily hydration, giving people fluid, making sure that they try to didn't get any infections, try to manage their medical health. And then we would do symptom management, mostly pain management for these patients. Uh, we then progressed to having hydroxyurea, which is a medication that decreased the occurrence of sickle cell crises and also m allowed people to live longer. Um, the average lifespan for females in the United States is 41 and for males is 39. And um, what we then did over time is we've developed new monoclonal antibodies. Monoclonal antibodies help the cells not pop into a, a, a shape that catches on blood vessels. And we have new technology that's coming out, which is a genetic editing. Um, as well as bone marrow transplant options. And I want you to address that later, but for a person like Josiah, and you can explain this from what you've been through and mm -hmm. as a child, uh, you know, this is all you know. Uh, talk about the types of pain that you may have in your joints. Uh, when Dr. Moransky was talking about these issues, when you have this kind of flare up, what do you experience? Uh, first of all, a lot of fatigue. Um, some of the most excruciating pain you can really ever think of. Um, it, it can really feel like a sharp stabbing pain. Um, you can have pain in your joints as well. Um, a lot of us deal with uh, what's called a vascular necrosis, where that is death um, into the bone. So therefore, literally our bone isn't getting any blood. So literally a lot of us at the age of 20, 25, I know people even younger have to have hip replacement surgeries. Um, believe it or not, I actually had, I needed in both my hips, uh, believe it or not. But a lot of us were made to suffer with it because hip replacement only lasts a certain amount of length. 
So a lot of the doctors aren't comfortable with, you know, giving it to us and having to operate on us every 10, 15 years. So you really just have to deal with the pain. So you're dealing with excruciating pain that can happen. Me and you can be sitting here talking right now and all of a sudden just that fat sickle cell crisis can happen. Excruciating, a stabbing pain, a aching pain, just something that literally is big as strong as I am will bring me into the fetal uh, position and not able to operate or move. You've done an incredible job in our community with outreach to educate people, the events that you have and those types of things. Uh, and also your faith, yes. which we can all gain from, and we appreciate all that you're doing in our community. Tell me how you've tried to educate uh, our community, your neighborhood, and also tie that with your faith to get through those moments and advise people on getting through those moments when they have them. Yes, of course. Um, well, you know, there are, there's a group that I'm a part of called ASAP, Advancing Sickle Cell Advocacy Project. And what we do is we go out to the community and we try to spread the word and inform people about sickle cell disease. Um, and literally whatever they need, if I am available, um, I make sure I attend to it and I make sure I go uh, because everything from uh, blood drives to uh, literally the city of Miami Gardens uh, named the ASAP day uh, after uh, the, the group that we're in. Whatever we can do to advocate. We also went to another uh, hospital uh, health system that decided to do a protocol um, and literally kick people with sickle cell out of the hospital in excruciating pain. Um, doesn't matter how you're feeling um, within a matter of days. Um, I thank God for people like Baptist Health because they don't do that. But this health system, what my uh, group did is we decided to storm their boardroom and let them know that this treatment is not okay. And because of that, things like the sickle cell task force was started that we're able now to try to change these protocols and get help for people with sickle cell in Miami-Dade um, and Broward. We do a lot of uh, thing on social media, uh, whatever is needed, we do to try to educate the people and help people with sickle cell, even if that means going to the bedside and um, advocating for them at the hospital. We do that as well. And it ties into my faith because me being a pastor, um, you know, I don't think I could have made it uh, with, with what we go through, with dealing with pain every single day, um, without having a strong faith base, without believing in a higher power that, you know what, in spite of the pain that I'm feeling, you know, I went from working all the time to literally having to get on disability. And because of that, you know, it was nobody but a higher calling and a higher faith that allowed me to continue to press on and know that I have more in this in this world to do. And because of that, I am able to now pastor and be a senior pastor of a church, Razor Sharp Ministries down in Miami, Florida, that I love. I love helping people. I also at, um, uh, inform my uh, members, my church members about sickle cell, and they're very faithful. Whatever any kind of sickle cell events that I'm having, they're right there with me supporting me. Okay, well, thank you for all you're doing. Dr. Moransky, uh, take us back almost a century uh, so that uh, people with uh, Josiah's and my genetics more predisposed to this, the work of Dr. William Cardosa to bring this to light and come forward, especially with uh, the focus on our African-American and Caribbean community. So sickle cell disease is a genetic disorder. Um, it's been around a very long time. Um, the reason we're seeing it in uh, predominantly African-American and Caribbean communities is because there's a link between sickle cell disease and malaria. Um, and so sickle cell trait actually has a protective effect for people who, have, who are exposed to malaria. And so areas that have endemic malaria are areas where you will find populations with sickle cell disease. So we often in the United States uh, find people who are African-American, people who are Caribbean. Um, you can also find people are who, who are Hispanic. Um, this is also possible in the Mediterranean as well as in uh, so th areas like Italy. So as a uh, disease state, we, it's an area that, that has malaria. The, it becomes an issue um, of, of being a common disease found amongst or common, more commonly found amongst people who are African-American or Caribbean because that's what we see mostly in the United States. In Europe, that's not. There's more people who are Italian or, or Greek who have, have sickle cell disease. Um, because sickle cell disease um, is a painful disease, and, and I should just put it into a frame of reference. So I'm a palliative doctor. I take care of people with bad conditions. Um, where things hurt, and I manage their symptoms, cancer patients, people with other genetic disorders. Um, 
Sickle cell disease, when we say that hurts, that's not like I stuck my hand in a car door hurts. Um, that's not like cancer pain hurts. This is the this is hurt like having a heart attack. A heart attack is a vasoocclusive crisis in the heart. Well, imagine doing that in three bones instead of your heart. It's that intensity of pain, um, and it is abrupt and it's intense, and it goes on for a few days. So. Um, when considering taking care of patients with sickle cell disease, it's it in combination with race, um, we have to use opioids frequently. And so opioids carry their own stigma and burden. Um, and you need professionals who are well-trained and educated to support and care for these patients um, because otherwise physicians are very uncomfortable writing for the amount of medications needed mm -hmm. to manage this condition. And they're, that's a real balancing. It act. is a balancing act, and yes. it's appropriate that they're uncomfortable because these medications require skill and experience and expertise to use. And so, for centers that provide care for patients with sickle cell disease, not any doctor should do it. Doctors that are trained and experienced and qualified um, are necessary, um, and that's one of the reasons why um, the way we've designed the the program at Baptist Health. Yes, and I want you to address that. You're on the cutting edge of this concerning sickle cell and treating people and patients coming in. Address the new technologies, the things that you're doing here at Baptist, because you all are in the forefront of dealing with this. Yeah, so what we've done is we've created um, a world-class sickle cell center where we, we know what is best practice across the globe, and we've incorporated that into our sickle cell care. Um, and Baptist has very, very long arms, uh, provides a huge network of services. And so what we've done is we've made a medical home model. So if needed, we can do stem cell transplant. Uh, we're setting up so that can, we can do gene manipulation. Um, these are cutting edge technologies that in some patients will produce a cure. Um, this technology will evolve over time and our rates of success and the application of these tools as we gain more knowledge as, as, and science advances, we will be able to offer those and do offer what currently exists to our patients. But there's a very forward-looking approach to, to caring for sickle cell patients at Baptist because we've opened up all the doors and are providing all of the services that Baptist has to offer for these patients. Josiah, please uh, tell us where you are with this uh, in terms of your uh, status with your treatments that you're taking and how you're able to function on a daily basis and move forward. Yes, um, really one of the uh, treatments that came out uh, uh, called Oxybrita. Uh, this is a condition where my blood level was literally down to an eight. Um, and that's really not uh, that good. Um, but because of Oxybrita, it has been able to bring my blood level up to a 11, sometimes 12. And because that is going on, um, I'm able to function. I'm not fatigued. Um, there have been days where I have slept in the bed all day, but literally I'm able to, as I said, pastor, go out and do different things, help the community whichever way I can. So with these type of treatments, they're needed because even as we know, during the pandemic, it was a very big shortage of blood. So there were a lot of sickle cell patients who were not able to get blood. So things like Oxybrider, this it, it allows and it helps us to be able to bring up our blood on our own. So stuff like this is a big help for uh, people in the sickle cell community. Dr. Moransky, what do people need to be on the lookout for uh, if they start having certain symptoms that they should come forward uh, and see you and see the team here to make sure that they can have a proper diagnosis? So um, we're very lucky in that in the state of Florida, all births are screened for sickle cell disease. So if you were born in the state of Florida in the last 30 years thereabouts, um, we've checked. If you come to uh, the state of Florida and you're having symptoms of bone pain um, or excruciating pain, or you have abnormal lab levels as a kid, um, we can do a single blood test and it can identify, um, and the pediatricians can do this as well, it can identify um, if a person has sickle cell disease, sickle cell trait, um, we have a fair amount of this screening happening for anybody that's going into sports, professional sports especially, but also amateur sports. Um, because when we hear every so often, every few years, we hear about somebody who was um, out in the heat working out uh, college, uh, high school football and they fall over dead. 
Um, and that's because they had an undiagnosed sickle cell disease um, frequently. Um, so if you haven't been screened um, or if you don't know what your genetic makeup is, then you can ask for that screening to occur um, because nobody should be caught by surprise. Some of the top things on the internet when people go and they are trying to find out information as lay people uh, about this, um, does this get worse as you age? And what about a life expectancy of someone that unfortunately does have sickle cell? So every single person is unique. Um, there is no destiny that's foretold because you have a diagnosis. The focus of our care is always about improving quality of life and level of function. Every person needs to get a customized plan of care. We need to give them what will best achieve their goals and allow them to live the life they want to live. Um, so with this disease, it is chronic and progressive for most patients. So people who have this, there are different variations and some people will carry a trait and not have any symptoms. Uh, some people very rarely will carry a trait and will only find that they have a symptom when they're in Colorado skiing at altitude. Um, and then there are some people that will find it as small children. So this disease does cause a, a life expectancy that's significantly lower than the population. Having said that, I've got plenty of patients that I take care of and that he knows that are in their 50s and 60s and 70s. And um, so it's not destiny. It is, it is something to work with um, and unfortunately is progressive frequently. And so what that means is getting a good care team to march alongside is really important. Having a medical home where all the preventive medicine and then the disease modifying agents, if the disease does progress and causes other complications such as renal disease or heart disease, mm -hmm. you need the expertise to, to support that so that you can continue to help patients achieve their quality of life and level of function. They can go to school, they can go to law school, they can graduate college, they can keep a job. When you get interrupted every, every 30 or 60 days and you, can't, you have to call out of work, it's hard to keep a job. If we can manage those symptoms so that you only go to the hospital when you have actually something that requires hospitalization, not because of symptoms, but because of an infection or some other complication, that's a win. That's making a difference for our patients. Um, and so sickle cell management that's good is supporting patients on a day-to-day -day basis so they can live their dreams and live their life to what they define as success. Uh, I want to ask you uh, something very close to my heart, so to speak, uh, coronary artery disease in our African-American and Caribbean communities, yes. uh, A1C, diabetes, watching those things, uh, blood pressure and watching those things. Uh, and I always say we can't control our genetics because we weren't there when our parents met. Right. But, you know, we can only control what we do with our diet, our exercise and the lifestyle that we lead. Address that portion of it and how that may play into uh, a role here. I always say if you're healthier, something's going to happen to all of us. But when it does, we're able to sustain it, get through it, and recover quicker. So a patient with sickle cell disease is, is, is still a person. They carry what every other human being carries as risks. And then they have additional burdens and complications of the disease. And so preventive medicine, good preventive medicine that's we would want for any of our loved ones is the cornerstone of care. Then on top of that, you layer preventive medicine and monitoring to catch in it as early as possible any complications of the disease and intervene. And that's why the, the network is so important. If I see that somebody's developing pulmonary hypertension or diabetes or, um, or kidney disease because of this, I can get them in and intervene as early as possible and that's why the medical home model is so important. We screen, we act as a primary care physician. Even if they have a primary care physician, we then pass that information on to their, their primary care physician. But everybody gets what we would want for ourselves and our family so that they can, uh, so that they can be comfortable and know that all of the necessary care that they would need or could need or is available is being provided. Uh, quickly, we need to do this in terms of the FDA and the approval that they made on some new technologies. Yes. Uh, brief us uh, about that and uh, where you are with it. 
So there are a few different technologies that are allowing us to rewrite the genetic material that writes for the abnormal uh, fragile red blood cell to write for either a fetal red blood cell or a typical red blood cell. Um, right now, success rate's about 25% of treatment. Um, that is significantly better than anything else we've had. As we go forward with further studies, when I say 25%, I should clarify that. For the person for whom it works, the work is 100%. Mm -hmm. For the people that it doesn't work for, there are other avenues. Right now, because this is a relatively new technology with CRISPR technology, um, and there are some other methods they're using to rewrite genetic code very specifically, um, we're seeing this in sickle cell. This will start to take place in other disease states when you can rewrite so you no longer have diabetes. Um, but you have to be very careful. You need to be very precise. And so these are, these are early days for that technology. Uh, but this technology that's being applied to sickle cell will be affecting and be available for so many more conditions um, that what we're learning in sickle cell is gonna help somebody who has a completely unrelated medical condition. Josiah, I would believe that this brings hope to you and the people in your community who have to deal with this on a daily basis. Yes, I mean, really though, uh, but as he said, because of the percentage rate, of course, we know we have to bring that up, but to have the hope to know that there's a possibility of a cure, that literally I won't have to live my life um, in pain every single day. Um, that brings a lot of hope. And even going back to what he said uh, earlier, um, it's very important to have that team, that healthcare team, um, a team that'll listen like Dr. Neil Moransky, a team that'll help because from a lot of my experience and other experiences, it get a little harder um, the older you get. But when you have the right team that's there with you, that's able to help you, you it, it feels like you can do almost anything and have people like him who's knowledgeable about these new technologies that's coming out and keeping an eye on it. The sky's the limit. Awesome. You're an inspiration to all of us. I know you're an inspiration to him and the team and anyone who comes across and meets you. And uh, please, both of you, continue your great work uh, in this area and, and beyond that. And thank you very much. A fantastic conversation. Uh, thanks for sharing uh, with us, both of you, your expertise and your insights from living through this every day. Out in our audience, remember, viewers, that uh, be sure to hit that subscribe button to our channel here to keep up with the very latest health and wellness information and tips from our experts. And thanks for being with us. Find additional valuable health and wellness information on our resource blog at baptisthealth.net slash news. And be sure to interact with us on our social media channels for live and upcoming events. Baptist Health Talk is brought to you by Baptist Health, the warmer side of care.